This isn't to say that absorption didn't exist in 17th century art. Um, we can just think of Poussin's assumption of the Virgin. She's literally being absorbed into heaven. But the absorbing object was usually a matter of mental or spiritual elevation. The figure would be absorbed with reason or divine inspiration. Even with our Polyxena, we see her obviously looking with compassion on her mother's desperation, but she is not absorbed in her mother's passion. Her resolution to die a dignified death is written all over her face. She has already withdrawn from the world around her, and her face has an air of transcendence. She has surmounted worldly concerns. So yes, in the 17th century, absorption was used in painting, but I would argue that it was an absorption in obedience to the principles of classical rhetoric, meaning absorptive virtue, the triumph of reason over passion, was treated in a heroic manner. As the Rococo movement begins to fade around 1750, there is a second rise in paintings depicting absorption, where a strong central narrative action anchors the image and the figures appear so engrossed in their activity that they entirely ignore the presence of the spectator. This format allowed the spectator to travel inside the narrative, according to Diderot, and experience the emotions at play as though it were real life. Diderot believed that this was the best tool of moral education for a population. Diderot's favorite painters were thus artists like Jean-Baptiste Greuze, whose dramatic, sentimental works often took simple peasant families as his subject and an emotionally charged point of morality as its theme. These were celebrations of inner feelings, felt not merely by the rich and beautiful, as in Rococo art, but shared by everyone. There was a marked absence of artifice and guile. Naivete and the role of the ingenue were supremely important because it was precisely in these empty cognitive spaces that art could attend to the proper development of a public morality. Diderot's project was one of broad moral reform through art, literature, and the stage. In this way, we see he is indebted to the thought of the Abbé Dubose, whom we discussed in our second week, in that Dubose considered that only those things or narrative events that could provide some sensation or relief from ennui or boredom in real life were those that were worth painting. The subject matter could no longer be love-drunk pleasure cruises around the Greek Isles, but moments of significant action where strong passions were primary. During Diderot's activity as Salon critic, we see art as a mode of education. But unlike the high academic work of Lebrun, it was an education for everyone. Finally, it was Jacques-Louis David who would bring Diderot's dramatic conception of painting to its fulfillment. David was considered by his contemporaries to be engaged in no less than the reinvention of the art of painting. Why? His subject matter was thoroughly neoclassical, meaning he was returning to the classical narratives of the preceding century. Heroes of antiquity like Socrates, Brutus, and the Horatii populated his canvases. What was new, however, and what so struck Diderot, was David's attempt to restructure the painting's relationship to the beholder. Let's look at David's most famous work, The Oath of the Horatii. Now what's going on here? This is a scene from a Roman legend about a 7th century BC battle between Rome and Alba. Instead of the two cities sending their armies to war, they have agreed to choose three men from each city. Whoever wins the fight, wins for their city. Rome sends the Horatii brothers, and Alba sends the Curatii boys. Just some ancient sharks and jets stuff. But the problem is that there are three Marias. But by that I mean that these families are very intermarried. The women on the right are seen sobbing because they are seeing their husbands off to fight their brothers to the death. And one cries because her, her brother, 
will fight her fiancé. No matter who wins, they all will lose. David's compositional construction is designed for sublime, empathetic identification. The typical anecdote told of this famous confrontation between Rome and Alba was one I told before during our discussion section about Horatio, the father in this picture. It's from a later moment when he hears that two of his sons have been killed and that his third was running away from the fight against the three Curatii boys. He responds angrily to the news, and his attendant asks, but what would you have him do? And Horatio responds, I would have him die. David has explicitly not chosen this, this scene of supreme stoicism, but instead invents a scene, the swearing of the oath, one that is bursting with emotion and conflicting devotions, do they fight for the glory of the state, or should they protect their family unit? Buttressed by the classical columns, they have made the patriotic decision in favor of the state order to sacrifice one's family for one's country, but the inner struggle is left visible in the emotional countenance on every face. Now, there are many ways to cut this political cake but it bears mentioning the next oath David would paint would be the tennis court oath, the founding moment of the French Revolution. Did modern art bring about modern politics? Of course, that's a real chicken and egg question, but I think it is worth running the risk of oversimplification here as a way of gesturing to the politics inherent in the reception of art and the art at work in political craft. The question for this week is the following. How has your conception of aesthetic taste shifted over the course of our lectures and discussions? I hope you enjoyed our lecture series for discriminating taste and I look forward to seeing you for our discussion section.